From a darkened room in a relatively isolated location in Alaska, a 38-year-old woman reaches out to the rest of the world through a journal she posts on the web. In a collection of stories she writes regularly about her son, she documents a 10-year journey. My name is Karone Sturm. I have a background in journalism, which gives me some added benefit in that I've learned how to research a subject, to find answers to questions. Little did I know that one day I'd write a story about my own life and post it on the web. It's a story I feel is important to share. It's really an evolving mystery story. I'm not sure where it's going to end quite yet, but I do know where it began. She uh, had a pretty nice pregnancy, as I recall, um, maybe some morning sickness, um, and then uh, went on to have a successful uh, delivery. But he just never stopped crying, and so that, that was a concern. And he was also bruised. He had a bruise on his head that we couldn't explain. But he did have uh, what I thought was a cephalohematoma, uh, which is a, a large bruise on the top of his head to the point that we actually got an x-ray of his skull. And that was such a scary thing. I thought, my God, you know, my infant baby going in for an x-ray. But that didn't show a skull fracture. Uh, so uh, we just chalked it up to the birth. Because he was born with jaundice, Jojo was placed in an incubator. Caron noticed he acted differently than her first child did at birth. He cried a lot, um, you know, when he was in the little incubation device with the lights and he cried a lot when he got home, much more than our first baby had. I figured he was just fine, that he was just a fussy baby. And, you know, about that time we had friends and I knew a lot of people who were having kids and, you know, talking about what it was like to have a colicky baby. So I assumed it was either that or, you know, I mean, he checked out fine with the doctor. So there wasn't really anything specific. On most days, Caron stayed home and looked after Jojo. But one day, she left her son in the care of her husband, John. When she returned just hours later, she opened the door to her home and was startled by what she heard. I just heard this horrible screaming. I mean, I just froze. This was a different cry. There was something going on. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could and and I, I saw John holding the baby, rocking him, trying, you know, so hard to comfort him. But he just continued to wail. I mean, he was, he was really um, having some sort of problem that we didn't understand. John and Carone took Jojo to the hospital. At first, the diagnosis seemed simple, but disturbing nonetheless. Well, she came at around five weeks or so uh, when uh, he had a very loud crying episode. And we evaluated him, and, and it seemed like it was his stomach. The doctor left to write up the orders, and I, I believe I handed the baby to John, who put him on the table to, to put him in his warm you know, coat as I was putting things in the baby bag. And then he, I just heard him say, look at this. And I turned. and and saw Jojo laying there on the table with both arms and one leg flailing in the air and the other leg just laid there limp. So I raced out of the room and I said, Bob, you know, our doctor said, come back here, get in here. And, and he came rushing in and he, and he looked at the baby and, and, he, and he looked up at us and he said, who's been watching this child? We went on and did an x-ray at the hospital, and they discovered that he had a femur fracture, which was uh, unexpected. You know, we could hear him screaming and screaming and screaming, and this went on and on. Oh, it was clear that, that, that many of them thought that we had, had beaten our child. At this point, Corone feared they would be accused of child abuse. This accusation intensified after doctors continued to x-ray Jojo. Subsequent x-rays uh, on that particular day showed that he also had uh, f other fractures on the rest of his body. So he looked like, uh, on x-ray, a battered child. He said that he had as many as you know, four or six fractures. 
And I mean, that's when the room just started spinning, you know. And he said, uh, I've got to tell you that this looks like a, a typical case of battered child syndrome. And if it's not that, it's a very rare bone disease that I've never seen in my practice, um, and it's, which is called osteogenesis imperfecta. And I think I knew at that point that there was no question that's, that's what Jojo had. This was the first time the doctors working on Jojo's case had come face to face with osteogenesis imperfecta. For Caron, suddenly all the pieces of the puzzle began to come together. Four times its normal density. Mm -hmm. Not only did all those pieces fit, you also thought about these things that you did, you know, for instance, putting him in the backpack and pulling his little legs down and, you know, all of these things, it was, you know, they just kind of rushed through your mind. So it, yes, all those, all those pieces made much more sense at that moment. And that explained why he had been so miserable at birth as he had actually broken his collarbone. The Sturms decide to take Jojo to Seattle for a second opinion. They're scheduled to see Peter Byers, a doctor at the University of Washington Hospital. Oh great, this is the new gel. It's very light, and I'm sure it'll be very difficult to see, but uh, he certainly has something that's unusual there. Be, I don't uh, think anybody wants their child to have something that is certainly going to be with them for the entire, you know, for their life. Uh, on the other hand, there's an explanation for what's happened. And that explanation gives them the potential and the hope that there is something that can be done. Through DNA analysis, Byers confirmed Jojo had osteogenesis imperfecta. It's very much a mixed blessing in that sense. Um, it means that they're no longer worried that um, they did something to the child, that they harmed the child uh, by doing something wrong, but instead that the child was susceptible to injury uh, that anybody could have caused and that it, it wasn't their fault. It raises the other feelings about where did it come from? You know, did I cause this? Uh, was it that, that fall down the stairs? Was it that drink I took? Um, any of the things of that sort that come up and the answer is no. It's a genetic condition and the reason it affects bone is that there are changes in the genes that make uh, the major protein or the major um, structural part of bone which is called collagen. Collagen is the major protein of the body's connective tissue. Imagine the structure of a typical building with metal rods inserted into cement to stabilize and give flexibility to the building. This is similar to what collagen does in the human body. In osteogenesis imperfecta, a person either has less collagen or a poorer quality of collagen than normal, leading to weak bones that fracture easily, often from little or no apparent cause. In addition to being fragile and brittle, um, the bone doesn't hold its shape very well. So the legs may be bowed, uh, the arms may be bowed, um, and just the normal formation of the normal shape of the bones is really quite effective. Sean Stevenson has one of the most severe forms of osteogenesis imperfecta. Even the act of getting out of bed in the morning can be a struggle. I'm no different than anyone else on the inside. And that really needs to come across right here and right now, that I'm no different than you are. And I think a lot of times we get caught up in, in this exterior package as if I chose it. The way most people look at it is that it, it must be grueling, it must be frustrating not being able to do all these things on your own. And I'm sure that there were moments in my life when they were. In the early stages of my life, I felt like so frustrated to have this. I think honestly everything that I have to go through in my life is more exciting than most. Most people just scratch the top of their head without even thinking about it. Every day I'm constantly humbled.
most people go through life taking a lot of things for granted. They get up in the morning thinking they're going to go to bed feeling the same way that they did when they get up. And that's not the case with me. I'm very well aware that when I get up in the morning, there is always that opportunity or that chance that I could fracture a bone and I could go to bed in excruciating pain. And when you have that in the back of your mind running over and over and over, you eventually get to realize that every moment that you're healthy and every moment you're not in pain, it's a great moment. Since Sean's birth 23 years ago, pain has been a constant companion. When I came out, my arm was broken in so many places that it was wrapped around my head and my legs were like floppy rag dolls and my head was just really soft and the whole body was, you know, ribs were crushed and my arms and legs were crushed. It had been, a, been like squeezing a child through, through some type of bread making machine that was just pulverizing the bones. From birth, Sean has relied on his parents to be his legs. You know, I'm vulnerable in their hands, and I, I could easily slip out of their hands and break my neck, and that's the end of me. Sean's father, Greg, quit his job in order to be Sean's full-time caregiver. He was so fragile that if he sneezed hard, he'd break a collarbone. Uh, if he took a little toy and picked it up, he'd snap his arm. Uh, I remember I got him a little toy, uh, a trailer truck, you know, and had a sliding door on the back of it. And he was laying in the kitchen on the floor, and he just reached over to slide the door up on the back of the truck, and I heard it click. He'd broken his arm. Uh, he broke ribs all the time, you know, sneezing, rolling, just took next to nothing to break a rib. Uh, the worst breaks were probably the collarbones and the femurs. Uh, and I think the worst, and it fortunately only happened once, maybe twice, was when he broke his tailbone. Because when you break a tailbone, you can't lay on your back. You only can lay on your stomach. As well as his fragile state, the disease has stunted Sean's growth and twisted his spine and limbs. Being born in Chicago was a fortunate turn of events for Sean. With his many fractures, he is close to a hospital that is preeminent in their treatment of children with brittle bone disease. The cases these doctors handle are some of the most severe cases and come from all over the world. We're operating on, on people, uh, children that, that really want to do, do better and uh, the the most rewarding thing is that the, the children and the parents have, have excellent minds and, and so you learn from that that despite their physical limitations they have an unlimited potential. Keith and Cheryl Weiss have brought their adopted twin girls Rebecca and Rochelle to Shriners Hospital for treatment. From China both four-year-old girls have osteogenesis imperfecta a fact known to the parents before their adoption. The twins may look identical, but OI has impacted them in different ways. While Rochelle suffers from constant, numerous breaks, her sister's OI is not so severe. How often does uh, Rebecca break? Rebecca is actually the, the uh, marathon girl. She, she, can go, she can go as long as six to nine months without breaking. Rebecca is being admitted to have a surgery performed called rotting. Yep. Rebecca's the one that's going to be going through the rotting this time. What they actually do is they, they, they open up the side of her leg, and it, it, the way it looks, they practically take the femur bone out of the leg, and then they cut it or break it in several places to make it straight. They drill a hole in the top of the bone and insert a rod down through the bone. It's a real small stainless steel rod. makes the bone straight, plus increases the density, and there's a hook on the top of it so it can't move up and it can't move down. It stays in position. Keith is knowledgeable about the surgical technique because he's been through the procedure before. Just a few months ago, Rochelle had her first rotting surgery. Well, it's been wonderful. She's not broke for two and a half months since we've had the surgery. And she's the child that breaks every month. So this is a really good thing. This surgical treatment is the most common choice for OI patients, but it's a highly specialized operation. Very few hospitals and very few doctors perform it. Here, rotting becomes almost routine. 
Rebecca has been breaking bones lately, and her parents have brought her in for this elective surgery. And while her twin sister has gone through the x-rays and surgery before, for Rebecca, this is all new territory. Shell's a real trooper. She, she takes a lot of pain and doesn't, uh, doesn't have too much of a problem. This is going to be a little different with Becca, because she, she gets a, a hangnail and she's got a basic problem. Oh, for everybody. It's okay. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Well, all done now. I done now. Say, follow us. Follow us. After Rebecca's x-rays are developed, they reveal an accidental break in her leg, just above the ankle. So did it actually break both of them? What is it called? It appears that way. Man, we don't know how old that one is over there. The fibula is a small bone there. It looks like it's healed already. Um, could have been broken at the same time. Could have been broken a couple weeks beforehand. So it is. Her, it is broke. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Wow, no wonder she's been so careful with it. A hospital room is familiar territory for Rebecca. Since coming to North America, she's been in and out of clinics on a regular basis, mostly as an outpatient. This is the first time she'll spend the night alone. Up to this point, Keith and Cheryl have decided not to tell Rebecca the details of the operation. As far as the rotting part goes, I don't know if they're old enough to figure out why, but as far as where, I don't know if a child that young would actually know. Okay. But it'll be neat when Becca's able to walk, it won't it? Yep, she's able to run around. Without breaking? Yep, without breaking. She'll be able to run around with you out in the yard. She'll probably pass you by. Yep. See, that's common, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. The simple act of running through the yard can be a difficult exercise for children with OI. Jojo Sturm, seen here in family videos at two and a half, is able to get around but not without difficulty. At this point in his young life, Jojo has had more than 25 fractures, most to his femurs and tibias, but he's also broken arms, feet, toes, and his collarbone. Pain is something Jojo lives with on a regular basis. Our desire to protect our son from fractures is tempered by the realization that he must eventually discover his own limitations. I've done a lot of research on OI during the past few years, especially hoping to find some sort of treatment that might help. I read an article in the journal Pediatrics regarding a study using high doses of vitamin C for OI. The results look pretty good to me, and we've been trying it for the past couple of years. The pressure I feel is to find something to make the fracture stop happening, and, and you know, and you know, in the longer term, sure, we want to we want to get him in as good shape as we possibly can before puberty, because that would determine whether or not he's going to be in a wheelchair, you know, for the rest of his life. It's the mothers, the incredible mothers. What giants they are! They they learn how to deal with the medical system. They're, they become tough as nails because they they demand make demands on the medical system that they need to. Um, it, you know they're really quite remarkable people when you hear this this whole story. Dr. David Rowe has been intimately involved in the search for a cure for OI for the past 30 years. He and Dr. Byers started out their careers together at the National Institutes of Health, where the first genetic snapshot of OI was seen. We were in a lab at the time, when we were at NIH, where we were studying collagen. And while we were there, uh, a number of people were working in a genetics clinic at John Hopkins, and they happened to bring some tissues and cells from some patients with OI and, for the analysis. And lo and behold, there was an abnormality of the collagen that we, no one had ever seen before. And it was the first genetic example of how collagen can uh, be, uh, have an effect on, on people. Both doctors Rowe and Byers left NIH. 
with Byers going to Seattle where he developed the first test to determine if a person had OI. Meanwhile, Rowe came to Connecticut and began to focus on a cure for OI. The search is not unlike the proverbial needle in a haystack, where the answers lay buried under a mass of genetic information. Just to give you an idea of kind of what the, the problem, the issue is here, this uh, big piece of paper here lines, lines up all the genes that are in the human body. And each line here represents a part of one chromosome and all the genes that are on that chromosome. And if you look at the fine print, there are actually, uh, there, uh, uh, all the chromosomes are laid out. And the one that we're primarily interested in is down here on chromosome 17, which begins right here and goes across and goes across. And I think the gene that we are working on is this little one right here and it's only one tiny one little smidgen area one base that is wrong that causes this whole problem out of this entire thing and so the problem then is is how are we going to go in and deal with this just this little tiny tiny bit of this entire mass that uh, of, of, of genetic information to make it uh, and to correct it in Rowe's lab, they search for the ultimate cure by using mice, which have an almost identical genetic footprint to humans. They're trying to correct the defective collagen genes they've implanted in the mice, and then take those findings and apply them to patients who have brittle bone disease. It's a process that is still in the theoretical realm, but Dr. Rowe is hopeful his theories are correct, and that within these walls they will unravel the OI mystery. Meanwhile, Carone Sturm continues her search for a treatment that will help her son Jojo. And she moves one step closer to that reality with a phone call from a local doctor in her home state of Alaska. Hello? From the relative isolation of Fairbanks, Alaska, Carone Sturm has been relentlessly trying to find some treatment for her son Jojo, who is suffering from brittle bone disease. To date, a successful treatment hasn't been found for him. And then, Carone gets a call from a local doctor who holds out new hope in the form of a therapy just developed. Is that ready to go? Doctor in town had told us about Fosamax, which is used for um, often women with osteoporosis. And we looked into that and it looked like a relatively safe drug to administer. And so we were pretty excited about that. You have to be a, 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 an aggressive person because you are really your child's advocate and if you don't do it you can't wait for somebody else to you know knock on your door and tell you that they're going to come find a cure for your kid it just doesn't work that way I hope it works I really do it's getting to the point where Jojo has a lot of fractures and nothing seems to be working like it should I dread what our next steps are going to be if we don't find something that will strengthen his long bones. What Carone dreads is having Jojo go through a rotting surgery, an operation about to be performed on a four-year-old girl in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, not so. We're going to rod uh, both both femurs. Mm -hmm. That's what we're. That's what the goal will be. After examining her x-rays, Dr. Smith determines he will place a thin steel rod through the middle of the femur bones in both Rebecca's legs. The rod about to be inserted is telescoping, which operates similar to the aerial on a car. In this case, as Rebecca's bones grow in length, the rod, fixed at either end, will extend with her growth. That's for femurs. It's four fingers, right? You did good. What are you going to do, do you know? Are you going to go get zippers in your legs? Yeah. What are they going to do? Are they going to straighten your bones out? Yeah. Hmm, they're going to straighten them out? Yeah. What are they going to do? What's going to happen after they're straightened out? What did Dad tell you? Are you going to be a ballerina? No. You going to ride a bicycle? Yeah. Yeah, and run through the yard? Are you going to rollerblade? You got no, run for the grass. Run for the grass. Hmm. 
And you can run out to the swing set and get in the swing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's just the thought of somebody else has control of, of what our child needs and am I willing to let go and, and let them do that. It's always scary, somebody going under anesthesia. You know, there's always that on, no one sense. Um, what's going on? What's going on while you're not in there paying attention? Somebody actually taking a bone out of her legs and, and cutting the bones or breaking the bones and sticking a rod through. You're, you're, putting, you're putting her life in somebody else's hands. Of course, when your child's in pain, you feel that pain also. Go, go to the door. Okay, you want to get your kisses and hugs? And we'll ring the bell and let them know we're here. We'll get your hugs. Give me a kiss. You want to come get us a second? Come up here, scooch up. Give me a hug and kiss. And I'll see you when you wake up. Okay. Hello, here's Hi. Rebecca. Rebecca's mom. Rebecca yeah. had uh, P.O. Priya. And then we got Hi, Rebecca. Oh. I'm Kathy. Any last minute questions? Mom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, last minute question, Mom. Need yeah. a drink? The operation is labor intensive and is expected to take more than four hours. You can look, it's okay. She's waiting. Mary, where you are, it's a little colder in here. Well, the underlying principle is the bone has to be big enough to, to support the rod. The purpose of the rod is to serve as an internal splint in the bone. And the reason is the bone isn't strong enough to fend for itself. Uh, there's an underlying structural problem with the bone. It's, it's smaller, there's less of it, and also it's, it's more brittle. It, it fails. And so um, the properties of the uh, a rod inside the bone are almost like the, how a rebar functions in a cement building. It provides more tensile strength, uh, whereas the, the bone itself is brittle and, and fails in these patients. Um, so that's the reason, that, and it, it supports things like uh, having them move more or, or, or even walk on bones that would otherwise uh, fail. The rotting surgery is a slow, painstaking process. The simplicity of the operation does not do justice to the precise manner of the technique. Under the skillful eye and careful steady hand of Dr. Smith, the bone is threaded together in a shish kebab like manner. We cut it in two places. We cut, we, the first cut we made was starting in this fracture and then we removed a little bone above that. And then the, we, we drilled this segment and where that bone, where that um, bend is, that's where we cut a second segment. So we cut this, uh, this femur twice to put the rod in. She's doing okay. Long day. As they wait for news of their daughter's operation, Keith Weiss begins to consider her surgical future. Probably the biggest fear of the entire operation to me is what happens with the rods. If the rods would happen to back out in the future, what do you do? More surgeries may be in Rebecca's future. Brought to you in part by the Purell brand. When there's no soap. Four-year-old Rebecca Weiss is in post-op after a successful four-hour rotting surgery on her legs. Hey, Becca. Hey, Becca. You hear Daddy? Can you see Dad? Daddy's here. Is he oh, dead? She asked for Rochelle too right away. You want Rochelle to come see you in a little bit? Do you? How about Sarah? Mm -hmm. Tang? 
How you feel? Yeah, your legs hurt? Yeah, they fixed them. Do they feel like they're fixed? Probably not. You got zippers in there? Is that what you feel? As a treatment, rotting is a state-of-the-art procedure for children with brittle bones, but it isn't perfect. The lifespan of the rod is limited. As a child, Sean Stevenson went through multiple rotting surgeries and has grim memories of having to go through what doctors have labeled a change-out of the rods. It was so excruciating. I remember as the bone, I could, I could actually feel the rod slipping out of the bone. Dragon cross, I don't know, maybe the bone marrow, the nerves, whatever. It felt not like anything I'd ever felt before. And I know that words can't do it justice, but it really felt like a vacuum was turning my leg inside out. And I remember my heart was beating so fast, and I was sweating so profusely, and my mom about passed out. She turned so many different colors, and, and I was just screaming out in so much pain. Even though he looks like any other healthy nine-year-old, Jojo Sturm is anything but. His outward appearance masks a framework of bones that are extremely fragile. Pain is something Jojo lives with on a regular basis. With brittle bone disease, the cold and darkness bring on a lot of pain in the bones of a child, which exacerbates the condition. It's been a while since we had this kind of snow, huh? Oh, good. This is a great shot. Open up. Caron has sought help for Jojo's OI since he was an infant, looking for answers over the net and keeping a journal about what she's discovered. Now, after many months of her son being on the drug Fosamax, the results of his latest tests are disappointing. We tried it for, oh, I don't know, probably six months. And again, <clears throat> no significant reduction in, in fractures, but it led to a very exciting thing um, after we posted the information on the internet we sort of had a following of people who would check in on the website and see what we tried and how it was working and um, out of the blue one day I got an email uh, message from Dr. Glorio in Montreal. Carol and I we got in touch by email it's interesting because as uh, I was getting uh, really tuned in the email and web uh, <coughs> browsing etc I, I use Osteogenes Imperfecta uh, uh, as a search tool and I ended up on her site and the site was a picture of Jojo telling his story and saying I need help so I wrote back and I say maybe I have something for you Dr. Glorio's search for an effective treatment for osteogenesis imperfecta revolved around a drug called pamidronate at the Shriners Hospital in Montreal the patients were receiving an infusion of pamidronate every four months in the hope that the drug will stimulate bone growth and strength. For Caron, the burning question is, will pamidronate stop the destruction of bone in Jojo's body, give him some relief from the pain of the disease, and allay her worst fears for her son? We want to get him in as good shape as we possibly can before puberty, because that would determine whether or not he's going to be in a wheelchair you know, for the rest of his life. And you do tend to just live day to day too, you just don't want him in that pain. I mean, that's, the, that's on the forefront of your mind. With Dr. Glorio's help, Jojo is placed on a pamidronate treatment and begins his infusions in a local hospital in Alaska. Even the simple act of placing a tourniquet on his arm brings tears. Jojo endures the pain as he has so many times before, and this time the story takes on a turn for the better. Jojo has now had three pomidronate infusions and we are thrilled with the results. The improvement has been nothing short of dramatic. The chronic bone pain is gone, stamina and endurance have improved, 
and he's grown over four inches. He now walks independently much of the time. And while he still suffers an occasional fracture, they are consistently the result of significant trauma. We're amazed at the number of times he has not broken when he's tripped, fallen, or been involved in some sort of mishap. This all seems too good to be true. For us, it's been sort of a miracle drug. We know it's not the ultimate cure, but I mean, it's certainly better than anything we could have hoped for, really. I can easily do pretty much all the things that anyone else can do. It's just I really have to be careful. Let go of this for a minute and just walk. I'm gonna just take this and you just walk. Now you walk. Now I want you to think about trying to walk without your side to side tilting. Do your best. Four times a week, Jojo undergoes therapy in order to increase strength and mobility. I'm happy now. I'm, I'm fine with this. In a five year study in Montreal, they showed that a significant number of pomidronate patients have seen the pain decrease and their fracture rates drop. By using bone density tests, they have proven the drug has often reduced the rate of bone destruction. While testing is ongoing, the pomidronate study shows promise for treating OI patients with the drug. The will of these children and the families to go through the incredible uh, fractures and rottings and spine straightenings and all the things that these poor children were exposed to and their families were exposed to. It was devastating to most marriages. They just couldn't, they, you know, it's just, it's horrible. Um, fortunately now, with this new therapy, that history is going to be, is being changed. We're not going to have to see that. Now it's just, it's, it's a miracle. For everyone touched by osteogenesis imperfecta, the disease is still very much a mystery, though the clues are starting to mount. Well, how about we do this with, uh, we will figure this out. I feel confident of that. Maybe I won't be the one to do it. I hope that our, what we've done, and the, the, the things that we've done, may provide a platform, maybe for somebody else, to fall on some lucky uh, observation that will clearly show that it, it does work. But I feel confident we'll do it. It will happen in my lifetime, although I may not be the one that does it. Um, that I feel very confident of.